Good morning, and welcome to First Methodist Church, the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Embrace Alabama Kids has kicked off their white Christmas offering by asking our church family to collect spare change and donations in the collection boxes provided in the North X. Return your fill boxes and place an offering plate or turn in at the fall fish fry on October the 29th. This Embrace Alabama was originally United Methodist Children's Home. Interested in joining the choir or would you like to sing in the Christmas cantata? They would love to have you. Visit choir practice on Wednesday at 6 p.m. to learn more. Food ministry volunteers and food donations, especially canned fruit, are still needed. Anyone wanting to get more information on volunteers can contact Linda Free Love. Blessing of the Pets will be Sunday, October the 2nd at 4 p.m. on the front lawn of the church. The Sunshine Crew has begun. It's not too late to join in on the fun. Children aged K through 4th grade are welcome. Next month's activity will take place on October the 12th from 3.30 to 4.30. We will gather on the lawn to watch Fire Prevention Parade and have pizza. If you've not registered yet, please visit the church website at fumcjacksonal.org slash children slash dash ministry slash or contact Fortune Sheffield. The fall fish fry will be October 29th at 4.30 in the Christian Life Center. All proceeds will benefit the White Christmas Fund for Embrace Alabama's True Kids. And this is a donation dinner, so please, please be generous with your donations. Join the FUMC Jackson family. If you've been attending the FUMC and want to join as a member of our church, now's a great time. <clears throat> Let Pastor Ralph know he would love to talk with you about being a member of FUMC Jackson. Thank you. I am the aforementioned Pastor Ralph. Welcome to First Methodist here in Jackson. I'm grateful you're here. If you are a guest this morning, or if you have a prayer need that you would like the, uh, the church to pray for, there's a tear off sheet. If you would fill that out, tear it off, especially if you're a guest this morning, if you would give us your preferred method of contact, uh, I won't call you unless you want me to. Uh, I won't email you unless you want me to, unless I Facebook stalk you, but that's a different thing. Uh, but uh, we're grateful that you're here. Uh, you, there are boxes in the blue bag, and we'll make sure they're in the narthex and, and the various places to collect change. And so I want to encourage you all to, to, uh, to begin to do that. Um, and my mind has left me. I'll remember the next thing that I was going to say at the end of church when I'm at home eating my lunch. Uh, I'm almost certain that's when it will come to me. Uh, but we are, uh, we are glad you're here. Oh, blessing of the pets. Please bring your pet or your animal. I haven't added this, but properly restrained. Can we, let's make sure we have hold of the cats and the dogs and the hossie. Okay. If you have a camel, stay about... 10 yards away, and we'll all be safe from the spitting and the biting that are normal with camels. But please come, let's uh, celebrate God's gift to us through our pets and, uh, and uh, bless them because I don't know about y'all, but my dog is a blessing to me. Uh, people smiled at me yesterday as I drove home from Birmingham because I had my dog with me, right? So that's a blessing because sometimes people don't smile at you. So come and join us and we will celebrate God's blessing to us together. Let's begin our worship this morning. The choir has already kicked us off. Would you stand as you're able and we'll continue with our call to worship this morning. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. They will say of the Lord, God is my refuge and fortress, the one in whom I trust. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the refuge of God's wings. They will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Those who love me, 
I will deliver, says the Lord. O Lord, we call to you now. Show us your salvation. God of Abraham, of Moses, of the prophets, we pray that your word will not fall on deaf ears, on closed minds, on hardened hearts. May the truth that is spoken today transform our minds and our hearts, unveiling the richness of your love, the depth of your grace, and the goodness of your mercy through Christ our Lord, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is a wonderful song, Come Thou Almighty King, found on page 61. We'll sing all the verses. By saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. I'm grateful for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, as I attended the uh, Board of Ordained Ministry meeting this week, I'm reminded uh, of your gifts that go to help prepare uh, clergy to pastor our churches. Uh, your gifts go to support the licensing school, which I'm part of. Uh, your gifts go to support the Ministerial Education Fund, which goes to help all of our seminary students and our course of study students. I'm grateful for your giving. Because of your giving, we're able to train and to uh, bring up, if you will, uh, clergy to pastor our wonderful churches in the Alabama West Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church. I'm grateful for your giving. <clears throat> Let's receive our Lord's tithes and offerings. Lord. 
Lord bless these gifts and tithes and offerings that we are about to receive. We realize, Lord, we've received them from your own hand. Bless this offering, we pray, to Christ our Lord.
Will you stand as you're able and let's sing the doxology together? Praise God. about a great gulf that is fixed between Abraham and, uh, and, and Lazarus is with him and then there's the rich man who's in torment. Sometimes when we have friends at school or friends in church or for the grown folks, people that they work with, sometimes they can't get along with that person, right? Maybe they just like different things. Maybe one of them eats broccoli and the other one can't stand it. Uh, maybe one of them likes lima beans and I know. But some people like lima beans, right? Some people like them big butter beans you can make a sandwich out of, right? And some people don't. Some of y'all have made a butter bean sandwich, just admit to it, right? When they're cold, you can put them, all right. <laughs> But there's one thing that we can do, whether somebody likes butter beans or broccoli, bacon or bologna, okay? Alabama or Oliver, since we're doing that. Go Jags. Um, we can pray, right? We can pray to God and we can pray for that person and we can pray for ourselves. Matter of fact, Jesus even taught us how to pray and we uh, are going to pray that prayer together in a minute. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really our prayer because the Lord gave it to us. We're going to pray that prayer in a minute. And it starts out, Our Father. Right? Do y'all know the rest of it? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us where? Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Right? That's what we pray. Because it's God's gift to us. And we can pray if we don't know how to pray. We can always pray that prayer because that's the one Jesus gave us. Let's pray and ask God to help us reach other people and to pray for them. Lord, help us to pray for all the people around us. When we don't know how to help, Lord, remind us we can pray. When we don't necessarily like that person, Lord, you told us we can pray for them. Help us to pray for ourselves that we might be the kind of children you want us to be, Lord. This we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, kiddos. It's good to see you this morning. Almost ran. Almost ran. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, your word tells us that there is great good in godliness combined with contentment. And Lord, as surely as we brought nothing into this world, we can take nothing out of it. 
Help us, Lord, to be content with what we have, to seek heavenly treasures rather than those things of the world which rust and corrode and moths consume. Lord, grant that we might be people who share the wealth you've provided, that which we've received from your own hand. Grant that we might be the ones who share both the bread and wine of earth and the bread and wine of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, today we pray especially for those who are like Lazarus, who lay at the rich man's gate, who are people like him who are ignored or neglected or suffer in this world. We pray for those who live in poverty within our, within our town and within our nation. We pray for all of those who lie in suffering at the gates of our nation and the nations around the world. God, bind your people together. Bind us together in your love and make us bright and, and shining witnesses to your compassion and to your grace. That's revealed in the law and the prophets and in the whole of scripture. And most especially in Christ Jesus, the one you raised from the dead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, hear too, we pray, the petitions and the intercessions of our hearts for those who govern and are in authority, for those who are public servants and especially for our firemen and policemen who are gathered in the middle of town helping to prevent accidents as they take care of that wreck scene. Lord, hear our petitions and intercessions for those who are lost in sin and who are despairing, perhaps even of life, for those who need healing. Hear our prayers and petitions. The desire of our heart for those whom we name in our hearts before you now. Those awaiting surgery. Those undergoing treatment. For those caregivers who sit with our loved ones. We remember especially today the communion of saints. Remembering Mr. Raymond Hughes. We pray for Nick Hughes and his family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers we ask all these things and we give you thanks and praise and in our minutes and in our days may we be the people you've called us to be through christ our lord who taught us to pray saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen.
Please stand as you're able for the reading of the word from Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who vested sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham, child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then I beg you, Father, to send me to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they, they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced, even if someone, someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Thank you, God. In, in my Bible, Father Abraham, Father is not capitalized, and I want it to be because I've been singing Father Abraham. <laughs> right? We sang that in Vacation Bible School. You've been with me in this sermon series, having words with Jesus, and you know that uh, the last few uh, parables, the last few passages that we've looked at uh, talk to us about how we are to, uh, how do we relate to things, to possessions, to riches, but most importantly, how to relate to people. Remember, the, the shepherd left the 99 to go find the one that was lost. And when, when he found that sheep, he rejoiced. The woman lost one coin out of her tin that she had, which was her dowry probably. And she lit every light in the house, which for us is as easy as flipping a switch. But back in the day, you had to buy that oil to light that lamp. And so that was an expensive endeavor to light every light and sweep the house to find the one. We know that uh, God is speaking to us through Jesus about how we're, to, how we're to treat people and how we're to treat the possessions that we have. Somebody said to me one time, um, we're supposed to love people and use things. But ever so often on a regularly ba regular basis, we get it backwards. We use people love things the old joke about you never see a u-haul following a hearse um, i can thankfully say in 31 years of ministry i've never seen a u-haul following a hearse uh, you can't bury all your stuff that you die with uh, thanks be to god so we're to love people and use whatever resources that are at, are at our disposal to express that love because we've been loved. This is interesting. This, this parable is the only parable in which Jesus names somebody. Every other parable, every other story, it's the person's anonymous. Uh, the woman at the well, the woman who lost the coin, the shepherd who went to find the one that was lost and left the 99 in the fold. Nobody else is named. And yet, when we get to this story to this experience this example he names the poor man Lazarus now some of you may call the rich man Dives I think that has uh, something to do with 
the Latin translation of rich man more than it has with what Jesus called him. Nevertheless, we're learning how we are to treat people. Remember, don't forget the Pharisees and the scribes are over here. They're trying to, they're trying to set Jesus up. And, and Jesus has all of these people who are following his disciples, the followers, the poor people, the random people who just came to see what the fuss was about. I drove through the wreck scene this morning, going up and coming back this morning as I went to Wesley Chapel. And everybody slows down and doesn't watch the road. They want to see what's going on with that truck. They're waving John, right? Because John's out there. There's all kinds of people, and, and some of them are rich, and some of them are poor, and some of them are crafty and some of them are innocent remember Jesus has already criticized the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes for their love of money and, and their power I guess every I guess every uh, every generation has its Rockefellers and Carnegies there's going to come a day when that won't make any sense to anybody because all the Rockefellers and the Carnegies will be dead and we'll all think that the library was named after somebody named Carnegie that lived in the community. Now, not every person who's rich is corrupt. And not every person who's poor is innocent. Right? There's always been the rich folks, the fat cats, the one percenters. Jesus said to us in Luke 16, 13, you can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. You must serve God. And so here we have this rich man. We don't know a lot about him, but apparently he ate fairly well, sumptuously, which is much better than eating good, sumptuously every day. That means not only did you eat shrimp, you ate shrimp that was carefully selected from the waters of the Gulf, chilled immediately and brought to your home where someone de-headed it, de-veined it, and prepared it perfectly for you. Not like the rest of us who get frozen shrimp and just add it to something. Right? Feasted sumptuous. And every day he passed by Lazarus who would have eaten the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table only if we read literally what's said here, he would have, but he didn't. Because the rich man apparently wouldn't even share the crumbs with him. Now, we're told that, uh, I read one commentary that said that the man, the rich man was dressed in purple and and purple was a sign of affluence. You remember Lydia, the, the seller of purple who helped Paul in the New, in the New Testament? I, I learned that uh, the purple that's made to dye the cloth is, uh, is made from snails. And I don't know how much snails cost, and I don't know how many snails it takes to dye a robe of purple, but I'm guessing they're not cheap and it takes a bunch of them. So we have this rich man who's content with the things, well, sort of content with the things that he had in life. He always wanted more. And here we have Lazarus, the poor man at the gate who lacked contentment in his life, who depended upon the kindness of others, as Blanche said in a streetcar named Desire. He's laid at the gate of the rich man in hopes that he might receive something. But he receives nothing except in some way the grace of God through dogs who lick his sores so that they won't become more infected. There's a gulf between Lazarus and the rich man in life. Even though the rich man just walked by him every day, there's still a huge gulf. There's a gulf between Lazarus and the rich man in death. I suppose there's a gulf between the haves and the have-nots that has existed in every generation. It's not new. 
It does seem like there's a greater gulf growing in these days, but it's prominent in all kinds of places. A gulf between the, the rich and the poor, the disenfranchised and the downtrodden and, and the, the powerful. It was in, the, in Jesus' day, it's in our day. There's a, there's a gulf between the good works that we can do and the grace of God. And only God can cross that gulf in Jesus Christ. All the stuff that the rich man had in life didn't do him any good in eternity. Matter of fact, he's in torment. And apparently all the stuff his family had didn't do him any good in torment. He lacked contentment in torment. And then we have Lazarus who had nothing in this life, probably left with nothing in this life except sores. And here he is in the bosom of Abraham, lacking nothing. He finds contentment in paradise. The rich man, it's interesting. The rich man is in torment, but he still... There must be a steep learning curve in torment because he still wants Abraham to send his do boy Lazarus to do something for him. Send Lazarus to bring me some water. And, 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 and when he can't do that, well, send Lazarus to my family. I'm thirsty down here. And they're going to be thirsty if they follow me. Send Lazarus. Isn't it funny how people in life or in death, if they're committed to using people, they don't seem to quite get the point. And even in torment, the rich man wanted Lazarus to do something for him. He's used to being served. He's used to having stuff. He's used to using people and loving things. And when he says to Abraham, send him to my family, Abraham's like, nah. <laughs> I mean, he was nicer about it, but nah. They've got the law and the prophets. Same as you did. He said, yeah, but if you send somebody back from the dead, they'll listen. He's like, nah. <laughs> nah, they won't. Christ rose from the dead and still sometimes people don't believe. They're so caught up in their power, privilege, and possessions. They still don't believe. They don't realize that they need the Lord. They need to acknowledge that relationship. They need to experience the love that God has for them. God bless the people with power and privilege and possessions that use them for the glory of the Lord and for the good of His people. God bless them. The Hindus try to connect all of creation and humanity, try to connect it all together and, and have humanity enthroned in some sort of common human consciousness. At least I think that's the way it works. My daughter got a minor in religion at Auburn and God bless her. I opened some of those books and quietly put them back on my bookshelf. That's some hard reading, y'all. If you think it's a struggle to read your Bible, let me introduce you to a couple of other books. The transcendentalists like Emerson saw God in humanity and nature is interconnected and, and nature was a witness of God and that sounds like scripture. Romans 1 tells us that we are without excuse. That you can just look out and know that there's a God and we are without excuse. Emerson saw God and nature connected with humanity in something called the oversoul. Sounds ominous. I don't know about all that, but I know for most of the time, people have looked beyond themselves for meaning. And the people that look beyond themselves for meaning, living in a higher, looking for a higher power, living on a higher plane of existence, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, lift me up to higher ground. 
The people that look beyond themselves typically have more contentment in this life. But the people who tend to look within themselves for meaning in this common current society, they seem to collapse and implode on themselves. That's why we have the law and the prophets. That's why we have Jesus to show us how to relate to people, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And God started a long time ago with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments tell us how to love God and how to love people. Isn't it funny that the Ten Commandments are almost evenly divided on how we are to love God and how we are to love people. And the part about how we're to love people oftentimes is rooted in how we treat their possessions. Don't covet a man's donkey. Don't covet a man's wife. Don't take what's not yours. Those are, those are North Georgia translations, right? Act right. That could have been right at the very top. Love the Lord your God and act right, right? We still have trouble with that acting right. Listen, the rich man's not named because it could be any of us. It could be any of us. According to a survey I took, uh, I'm middle class. Any of y'all grow up middle class? I did. We were lower middle class. We had too much, but not enough, right? You ever been in that spot? Too much, but not enough? Too much to qualify for X, Y, Z and not enough to get X, Y, Z. But you know, if I were to just simply change locations, I'm not so middle no more. I'm pretty low. Like, I'm not moving to Austin, Texas because y'all are 1.2 million for a 900 square foot house. No, 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 no. Although if you've got 1.2 million, I would love for you to give it to me so I can buy a house near my kids. But I've been on mission trips to Myanmar and to Venezuela. I'm upper class down there. I'm upper class in other places. You see, the thing is, that rich man could be any of us if we use people and love our possessions. When I think of this passage and how this man could have used his power and his possessions to make a better life, not only for himself, but also for Lazarus, I'm reminded of, uh, of Eliza uh, Daniels. Now you all don't know Eliza Daniels, and I don't know much about Eliza Daniels, except that Lazarus is a derivation of Eleazar, and so is Eliza a variation of Eleazar. We, we see the name Eleazar, which means God helps in all kinds of places in Scripture. Uh, Moses' son was named Eleazar. The head slave in the house of Abram was named Eleazar of Damascus. The prophet who rebuked Jehoshaphat for aligning himself with Israel when it was under judgment from God was named Eleazar. I don't know much about Eliezer except that Eliezer had a rather large, expensive obelisk headstone that wasn't in the cemetery of Rocky Mountain United Methodist Church, but it was out beyond the wood line, the tree line, buried in the woods. And Eleazar and, and, and Eliza Daniel's grave was surrounded by other graves that you could see because of the outline of the jungles that outlined a sunken place in the earth. I don't know much about Eliza, but I know that Eliza is buried in what we probably would say is the slave cemetery. Now, Eliza died in 1915 
April of 1950. Probably born the son of a slave or the sons of those who were born to slaves. I don't know anything about Eliezer except that his family must have had high hopes for him because they named him God Helps. And they knew that whatever possessions they had, whatever power they had, whatever privilege they had, meant nothing if they did not have the help of the Lord. And Eliezer lies buried out in the woods beside Rocky Mountain United Methodist Church. His family, who may or may not have had much, maybe it was his descendants who had something. Maybe they had something because he had something. But I know this. Whether you have or have not, it is your relationship with God that makes all the difference in this world and in the next. If you want to be rich, be rich in the Lord. If you want to be poor, be poor in the Spirit. Poor in Spirit so that you can be rich in the Lord. Lazarus found contentment in God. Contentment in paradise. He left this world with nothing and he carried nothing with him into heaven. The rich man had everything in this world and he carried nothing with him into Hades, into torment. Not even enough water to cool his tongue. And not even enough hope to think that his family had changed their ways upon his death. I know that many of us could be the rich man. And sometimes we ignore the people around us who are hurting and who have needs and who are suffering. I'm guilty of that. I've been trying real hard to be more aware, but sometimes I miss it. Yesterday, as I drove home from Birmingham, I made a conscious effort to make sure I smiled wherever I went. I got smiles back. Probably because my dog, Duke, had his head hanging out the window at the restaurants I stopped in. Oh, is it a he or a she? His name is Duke. Oh. He's 13. Oh. And no, I don't need sauce for my McNuggets. They're for him. He's 13. He gets what he wants. I'm pretty rich by worldly standards. I can buy my dog McNuggets. The least I can do is smile at the people who hand them to me. You see, you and I have been blessed. We've got all the time in the world that God has given us. We have all the possessions that we've been able to accumulate. We've got all the whatever it is that we've got. We've got all of that. Even if we don't have much, what we have can be used to love God and to love our neighbors. And that great gulf that exists between the haves and the have-nots, the Christians and the not-Christians, the people who call themselves Christians and they can't stand church people and the church people who can't. You know, there's a gulf that only God can cross. But He's given us the Holy Spirit. And He's given us the witness of Jesus to cross the gulf between all of ourselves. If we'll only just do it. I would encourage you, use whatever you have, time, talent, tithes, whatever you have. Even if it's just the simple ability to smile at people, use it to show love to people with the love that you've received through Christ Jesus. You can do that. I know you can. You can do that. Lord, help us to do that. 
Lord, we may not have much in this world, but we have you. Lord, if we don't love people like you've loved us, if we don't touch people as you have touched our hearts, if we, if we don't feed people as you have fed us, Lord, if we don't do that, then how will people know? How will people know, Jesus, that you're real and that you love us? Lord, help us. Help us to find contentment in you as Lazarus did in paradise in the bosom of Abraham. This we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand as you're able as we sing our final hymn, Are Ye Able? One of my favorites. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. <laughs> so much for worshiping together today here in this place. May God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.